Hi, I'm Kinkas. Welcome to part two of the Tukra video manual. Let's get right to it. I'm going to start today with two features that have been requested a lot. So I'm going to teach you first how to update the firmware. This has been a little bit fiddly using the Teensy loader. So I have a way to do it that's a little bit more complicated, but also less prone to error. And then I'll show you how to prepare and load your own user samples. And after that, we'll go into the modulation matrix and continue on with the manual. Okay, so how do we do the firmware update? Well, I have here my manual open, right? And uh, right here in the very beginning of the manual, it says get the latest firmware here, right? Maybe in the Tesseract Facebook group, this will be easier. Tesseract, two cray users. Yeah. If I click on this, that, yep, that worked from there. I was able to download it. Now, here's the thing. You can use the Teensy loader, as it says right here, right? Click here, and uh, you can just download the Teensy loader. But that has been very buggy and weird for a lot of people, and myself included. I've had lots of trouble updating the firmware this way. And I've discovered that instead of doing this, if you download the actual Teensy Duino software, right? Download Teensy Duino. You can just click on here on the OS X installer, right? That's just downloaded into my machine, but I happen to already have it installed. So I'm going to click on my Teensy Duino program here. And now let's turn off the little modular here and we're going to have to remove the Tukra and make sure you have a good quality USB cable, good one for data. Some USB cables are power only. Let's pull out the power cable here. We don't need the power cable for the update. I can actually prop my Tukra right back in its spot right there so it's not moving around. Stick in the cable and plug it in to my computer. Okay, so here in the Teensy Duino program, in tools, where it says board, you have to choose Teensy 4. Now, right here, click on open here and choose any, any program. It doesn't really matter. I get the blink one here. If I hit upload, it's going to compile a sketch and then it's going to open the Teensy loader from in here. And this is the Teensy loader. It looks the same as the one, the standalone one. But for some reason, it works way better. Let's close up this blink now. Over here in the Teensy loader, we can click on this little thing here and go to the downloads folder and choose the Tukra 1.17 hex. Now we need to push the button on the Teensy itself. A little button here. And uh, hit program. And cross your fingers. <laughs> But yeah, I'm pretty sure that it should work because I'm using it from within the Teensy Duino program. Cool. It says download complete. We can now hit reboot here. It says reboot OK. Now we should turn our Tuker around and it's on. Aha, perfect. So it worked on the first try. And uh, it definitely didn't work on the first try whenever I used the standalone Teensy loader. So that's it. Just download Teensy Duino and uh, try to uh, flash any old program to your Teensy so it'll automatically open up the Teensy loader. And then from there, from the Teensy loader itself, you can load up the hex file and program your Tukra. So that's it for this part. Let's go on to checking out how to load up your own user samples. I'm going to need my SD card for this next part. All right, folks, let's have a look at how to prepare some files to import into the Tukra to use as our user sample files, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is using my own DAW, and my DAW of choice is Reaper. And you can use Reaper too because the demo is free. So if you don't have a DAW of choice that you want to use to do this, you can just download Reaper and follow along with my every step. Let's start a brand new Reaper session, right? You can start a new project over here. 
and I've already done that so this one is called Tucker sample prep so the first thing I'm gonna do is import my samples in here I've got this folder called new kit where I've been collecting sounds that I find that I stumble upon that I think I might use as uh, one shots so I'm just gonna select all the ones that say wave drag them right on to the screen here and uh, Reaper's gonna ask me if I want them to be single track or separate track single track is fine right so now what I'm gonna do is just erase everything that is longer than a one hit right and you can easily see there's even a whole song here uh, probably got thrown in there my mistake these little model things are all uh, generated in the MBC by splitting loops. I don't want these for this. All right, so here's a couple more longer loops. Now it looks like everything that's left is one hit. Well, here's a loop. All right, let's get rid of that one. I think everything else, yeah, everything else are one hits. Cool. So the first thing we need to do uh, to prepare these to go into the Tukra is turn them into mono files. And you could split this into mono and just use the left side and that would work. But I feel like some of these have interesting material on both sides. You would have to hear one by one and choose and that's time consuming. So what I'm going to do is first I'm going to select everybody. Then I'm going to normalize them. So I right mouse click and choose item processing normalize items right so now they're all hitting zero however if i'm gonna bounce them in mono they're gonna clip because when you get two sides of stereo file and just sandwich them together in the middle uh, they'll add about 5 db so we need to bring down item volume by 6 db here we go let's uh, make this a little bigger grab this line here and bring it down to it says 6 6.02 is fine Okay, so now I'm gonna click uh, Option Command R for render. And on source here, I'm gonna choose selected media items, okay? So instead of going by track or by routing, it's simply gonna render the media items, which are the little files that I've selected here. However, I'm gonna ask them to be, instead of stereo, they're gonna be mono, right? Another thing is we need these to be 44 kilohertz, 16 bit files. So here we go, 16 bit files, wave mono at 44.1 kilohertz, 44,100 kilohertz. Right, and I can choose where I want to render them to. Come right over to my Tukra sample prep folder and choose that, right? And now I click on render 55 files. So there they are rendering. So let's go back to desktop here and we have Tuker sample prep and now all those files are over here and uh, numbered. So let's bring them back to the session single track there they are now they are summed mono and if i normalize them again now i'll make sure that they're at their loudest possible volume as well right they're all hitting zero there and they're all mono now so they're almost ready for tukra so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to export these again render 55 files That's how I like to prepare these files. There are many other ways that you can do it, but let's take these now and we're gonna open them up in Audacity, right? If you don't have Audacity, download it. Just uh, Google search for it. It's free software. And it's the one that we're gonna need to use to generate the raw audio files that are required by the Tukra a very specific naming convention too. They have to be raw in all caps and simply numbered from one uh, to 256. Oh man, but they opened all as separate. They opened as separate files. I will just choose Audacity and force quit it. All right, let's just open Audacity. Now we can choose import here, import audio. 
right? And now we're gonna come over here to to cross sample prep, right? And we're gonna choose our 55 files that are mono, normalized, uh, 44 kilohertz, 16-bit files. It's gonna show them all here. Now all we need to do is go to export, export multiple. And here we're going to choose raw headerless signed 16-bit PCM. And for the naming, we'll just use uh, label track names for now. We'll look at uh, how to number them quickly in a little bit. Let's choose where, right? And we'll create a new folder on my desktop called uh, new to Cura samples. There we go open that up and export and uh, there we go so let's go look let's close up here and let's go look at my desktop the new tuker samples are all right here and they're numbered but uh, they have this weird numbering which is the dash thing etc so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna run an automator here from the Mac OS. We're just going to use a, uh, a quick action instead of creating a whole application for this. On files and folders, we need uh, get selected finder items. Then we want to rename finder items. And here we're going to make sequential, right? And we'll make it a new name, right? And we won't add anything here. We'll also remove the dash and make it nothing. This is going to rename all our items in numbers from 1 to 55, right? So let's choose them here. These are all our new Tucker samples, right? And uh, we can run this quick action. And there we go. I think that worked. Let's look at our desktop here. The only thing is they didn't go into like a folder or anything. So I'm just going to grab all of these and create a new folder. Tukra user samples. And we can throw out that new Tukra samples if we want. Now these are almost perfect. But the raw is in uh, lowercase. And they need to be in uppercase. So I'm going to select everybody over here. And in the very same finder window. And by the way, this is the, uh, the article I found os10daily.com, change file extensions on the Mac. And uh, it shows me how to do this to all of them so I don't have to be clicking on each raw and changing it to uppercase, right? But there is something that you need to do before you can actually perform the batch change, which is go to the Finder menu, go to Preferences, right? So let's go to Finder here, click on Preferences, and then in Advanced, there is a show warning before changing an extension. You have to unclick that. See how it's unclicked here on mine? That needs to be like this in order for you to be able to batch change the file extensions. And uh, on advanced here, you can choose rename. And over here, you choose replace text. Okay, just type the lowercase raw here and replace it with uppercase raw, right? And then click rename. And now all of these are renamed 1 through 55 raw. Now I'm going to open another finder window here and I have my Tukra SD card. And over here in samples, I'm going to remove my previous samples, which didn't work because as you can see, they are lowercase raw. So I have figured out with Mangu that that was the issue. We're going to delete them and we're going to empty the trash. So they're not anywhere. Uh, visible in this SD card anymore. Now we can choose all of these files over here and copy them over to the SD card. And that's it. We're just going to eject that SD card now and stick it back into the Tukra. Be right back. All right, so here's the card. My Tukra is turned off. I'm going to stick the card right into its slot. We'll place the tuker back in its spot. And uh, now we'll plug in the skiff and uh, watch the tuker turn on. Okay, so now the procedure to load those new samples is shift 
function in the file the folder here. And then we'll just watch as those LEDs turn green. And that's the process. That means it's loading. Now look, what it's doing is it's scanning the spectral content of each one of the new samples so that it can then categorize them automatically so that all your kicks will be close to each other, all your snares close to each other, hi-hats, etc. Just like it does with its own internal built-in sounds. Connect the audio outputs. Oh, see, it's actually even playing them back. We were missing out. It's playing them back as it scans them. So these are my own sounds. Some of them I've designed for commercial sample packs. Some I just stumble upon in my productions, you know, come up with a sound that I really like and I think would be useful elsewhere. So I just save them into a little folder. That's what I'm going to have available in my Tucra now in mono, but it doesn't really matter. There we go. It seems like they're all loaded now. Okay, so let's check out the modulation matrices, right? The uh, way to get to the modulation matrices is by holding shift in combination with certain keys. So for example, you have shift mixer opens up the modulation matrix for the mixer parameters. And the way you choose what you want to modulate is by clicking any button on the grid. And basically the column that you choose will determine which parameter and the row that you choose will determine which track. So for example, if I want to modulate the reverb of track five, I would push this button right here, right? Because this is reverb and this is track five. If I want to modulate the volume of track eight, that would be over here. Now this is the mixer modulation matrix, but you can also do the same to the drum page, right? So if I hold shift and press drum, now I have a modulation matrix for the drum synth parameters, right? So now this row determines what you're going to modulate. So if I choose this column over here, which is the pitch track seven, I'll be able to modulate the pitch for the drum synth on track seven. I can also choose the heart icon over here, the live view, and this gives me two parameters, which is sample selection, right? And sample pitch. Note that sample pitch will only work for the user bank. You can't modulate the pitch of the factory sounds yet. Now you also have another one, which is shift and the three little lines icon over here. This is a modulation matrix for length, clock divider, Euclidean number, rotation, master filter cutoff, master filter resonance, and master filter type. Now, there are other ways to get to the modulation matrix too. There's shortcuts. For example, if I'm in the mixer view over here for track seven, right? By holding shift and pushing any of the columns, it'll go to the modulation matrix with that parameter selected for that track, right? So for example, if I want to modulate the panning of track seven, I will just press any button on the third column here. Track seven's panning is selected and blinking, right? That also works in the horizontal view. So here, this is my horizontal view of the volume, right? So where I can set the volume for all tracks. If I hold shift and press any of these, it'll go to the modulation matrix and select the volume for the selected track, right? And now, once that's selected, the numbers column selects your modulation source, right? One, two, three, and four are the CV inputs, or if you don't have anything plugged into the inputs, it's the potentiometers, right? Five, six, and seven are three random values that change with every step, and they're independent from each other. So you can choose different random values for different parameters, and that way you can get more variation. 
And number eight here is MIDI CC Learn. And I have my Sweet 16 connected here via MIDI. For this one, you have to hold the button. So for example, this is the volume for track seven. If I hold button eight over here and move a fader, now that has changed to yellow, it has been selected. Now this fader will modulate that parameter. It's a little bit complicated to understand in the manual, so I'm gonna try to demonstrate everything that I've just described so that you can really see it working. Let's do something very simple. We'll program a bass drum beat over here. So just the bass drum, so we're not confused, okay? So now let's go to the modulation matrix for the mixer, right? I held shift and the mixer. So I want to modulate the volume of track one, for example, right? So I've chosen that point. Now I have to choose a modulation source. So if I push one here, that'll be my input one. Now I can use the encoder to set the modulation amount. And as you can see, it goes from a blue through purple to red. Now I can use the first potentiometer here This can be very useful because it gives you a more hands-on control over four parameters of your choosing that you might think are important for your performance. And of course, this will also work with any modulation source that you send to that input. So here's input one. I'm sending my rampage module there. And as you can hear, that's modulating the volume of my kick drum. Right. Let's pull that out. Let's choose a different modulation source, right? So again, that's still selected and I can choose, well, let's skip over two, three, and four because those are the same thing, just different inputs. And we can choose five, six, or seven here for a random value. So as you can hear now our kick drum volume is being randomly modulated. And these are three different random generators, random value generators. Now if I hold number eight and move a fader in my Suite 16, now this fader controls my kick drum volume. If you have the Suite 16, it gives you 16 faders that you can assign to 16 parameters in the Tukra. So you can have, for example, uh, the eight volumes for your eight voices and basically have a mixer here. And then you can have maybe the eight pitches for the user samples that you're using right up here. So again, the combination of both modules can make the Tukra more hands-on than it already is. Of course, you can simply do the same by going into a, a horizontal view of the volume, right? We'll learn how to do this in a little bit. You can also lock the launch pad to a particular page. So you could have the launch pad be your mixer, for example, have your volumes there. In fact, the Tukra expanded with a Suite 16 and the launch pad becomes a super powerful and very hands-on device. Now let's say you want to use one of the internal LFOs as a modulation source. For that you use the multi-select. So let's go back to the modulation matrix for the mixer. We'll once again choose the volume of track one, right? And using multi-select, I can now press any of the number buttons and select any of my internal LFOs. So that's one, it's already giving us a nice rhythmic dynamic change over that kick drum. Here's number two. So each one has a different setting right now. You can audition them. And of course you can edit these LFOs too, we'll get to that. All right, these are all our eight built-in LFOs that the Tukra has. And additionally, if I hold the shift key and then press any of these numbers 
in the numbers column, then what you're doing is you're applying the step value of each track to the selected parameter. So that way you can actually use the step value of any track to affect the parameter of any other track very easily, right? So I don't have anything programmed for step values right now, but if I did that, we're now using the step values of track five to modulate the volume of our kick drum. It takes a little bit of getting used to. It'll be nice to maybe have the graphic from the manual printed out for a little while until you get used to these. I personally have already pretty much memorized them. So you have buttons one, two, three, and four are the CV inputs, five, six, and seven are random, holding eight and moving a MIDI controller will learn that CC value. By holding multi-select, I can choose one of the internal LFOs, right? And the LED actually reflects that LFO too, which is really handy. It gives you a visual representation of the LFO speed and wave shape, right? And with shift, I can select the step value lane of any of my tracks to modulate that parameter, right? So let's go back to that uh, CC here. I'm gonna hold eight and move fader number one. And there we have it. All right, so hopefully you got the gist there of the modulation matrix. It takes a little getting used to, but it's a super powerful and super fun to use and it really brings the two girl alive when you start using external modulations either via MIDI, via CV, or via the internal LFOs, internal step values, and uh, internal random voltages, etc. Let's now move on to the functions in row four. First, let's load a project, right? And uh, this one's probably fine. There we go, that's a good beat. Now we hold the function key on these arrows over here, and that's the play mode, which is the direction. And there are eight such modes. The first four ones are always one shot, and the other ones, so if a clock division is bigger than one is applied, will be step repeat or re-trigger mode, right? And the way you select them is by just choosing one of the eight buttons on each row, right? Each one. Each button will represent a different play mode, right? So if I choose here for the kick drum, play mode one is just forward, so that's normal. Play mode two is backward. Let's do that to the, uh, the snare here. We'll probably really feel it there. There we go. And you can see how the cursor, which is the red dot, is now going backwards, right? If I choose number three, that's a ping pong, goes back and forth, see? Four, at random. Now five is step repeat, which will only really work when our clock division is greater than one, right? And we'll get to clock division in a little bit. So these are the same, these are forward, backward, pendulum, and random, but with step repeat in the case that the clock division is greater than one, okay? So let's put this snare back on one here. But now, as you can see, it's offset from the rest of the beat. So if I want to reset it, I can always hold my function key and press play. And now everybody's back on track. Now holding function and pressing the next key on this row, that sets our pattern length. For example, this kick drum over here, I can make that. Six. And I can actually set them uh, up to 64. The way to do that is by using the zoom, right? So if I change my zoom view to 16, I can now 
right, have a longer pattern than just eight beats. And I can even do that all the way to 64. So if I, I have my maximum zoom here, I'm looking at the entire 64 steps. And now here we go. See? So every 64, we're going to get that, that kick drum there. And of course, I can press my encoder here and change which track I'm visualizing, right? So four, I think, is the snare, right? And now I'll come to our program page, step program page. I can add, I can make a more complex pattern by having more variation, longer pattern, more variation, right? This is that kind of a grace note snare there. Cool, so that's where you set pattern length. If I hold shift and set a length for a track, that length will be set for all tracks. Boom. Now we have everybody set to eight steps again. Let's resynchronize. There you go. That's our original pattern once again, just eight steps. Oh, and by the way, if I hold multi-select, it'll show the length of the selected track, right? And I can use the encoder to change that value. So I've just set track one to be 24 steps long, okay? If you don't want to get into the zooming, you can just hold multi-select and see it. Let's select track uh, five here, right? Hold multi-select and I can change it to nine. So that hi-hat now, it's kind of shifting, kind of changing every time. See? Let's choose this snare drum here and hold multi-select and we can make that one 11. Cool. So now we have some polymeter stuff going on. Now let's say you want to make the track longer but you want to you wanted to copy what you already have in there. So for example, you want to create variation for the hi-hat, but you want to start from just copies of that hi-hat pattern, right? First of all, let's select that track, right? Track five here is the hi-hat. And now I can hold copy and turn the encoder. I can hold multi-select too. So now it's a 64 step pattern, right? And I can zoom into it and see how it's copied that original nine step pattern all the way up to 64. Now I can go back to the uh, step pattern programming and create my variations. Like delete some, add some, you know. If you're in mid-performance, for example, and you want to make that pattern longer, you won't have silence until you program things. You will just have a repetition of the original pattern, and then you can make your changes on the fly. Now, holding function and the division over here will open up your clock divider. Let's unzoom. So now we have clock divider here. Let's resync. And basically, I can choose a different clock division for any of the tracks by just pushing the buttons, right? The division is represented by these green lights over here, right? This is division by four, this is division by three, this is division by two, these are one. Do this here, so everybody's back to one. So holding shift, half time everybody, everybody back to one, triple everybody, right? So holding shift will apply that clock division to all tracks. Holding multi-select will display the division for the selected track. So right now, 
track two is selected. If we go back to a division of two here and hold multi-select, we'll see the number two, All right? And I can randomize it too. Hold the randomize button and just press the number for each one of these. And now they each have a different value. And we can speed it up to really kind of feel that. So this is this is the way to actually do polyrhythms, because since you can divide by three and by seven, then it's beyond polymetric, it's actually polyrhythmic. This is a polyrhythmic beat right here. So let's uh, bring everybody back to one. Yeah, we can bring that, that tempo back down again. And reset so everybody lines up. Cool. Clock division is super fun to play with. Moving on, this is the Euclidean pattern generator. So Euclidean rhythms, simply put, is a way to generate rhythms mathematically where you determine how many hits you want within a set number of steps. And then it'll distribute those as evenly as possible, right? But respecting the step division. And, and you will find when you play with Euclidean rhythms that a lot of classic rhythms from different cultures in the world are Euclidean. So it's a really cool way to generate classic rhythms without actually programming them step by step. And you can discover rhythms that way that maybe you never stumbled upon them before. So this is very cool. Let's have a quick read at the manual here. Algorithm that distributes a number of beats within a number of steps in the most equidistant possible way. There are three parameters that will affect the resulting pattern, which are length of the pattern, number of beats to distribute, and rotation of the pattern, aka offset. So the length you just set by setting the length as we have already done. So let's hit play on our pattern here again. And now we'll go into the Euclidean generator here. And I'm setting how many hi-hat, open hi-hat hits I want in my pattern. If I choose track one here, we have that kick drum now. setting how many kick drum hits I want within those 16 steps, right? In fact, why don't we generate a brand new pattern based on this? So I'm going to go to my pattern selector here, select one that is empty. And uh, here we can see that the cursor is moving. Now we will go to the Euclidean pattern generator and uh, select track one and start moving it. So this is just four on the floor, right? If I add a third, now if I choose track two, now I have something very interesting happening there. Right, let's choose track three here. Now I can offset it, right? I'm going to get ahead of ourselves here and select the Euclidean offset. And I can nudge that pattern forward until I get it where I want it, right? Let's choose track four here. We'll go back to the generator. Very cool, and as you can tell, these rhythms are not strange. They're rhythms you might find. This sounds kind of like samba, actually. Like kind of between funk and samba. All right, let's choose track five here. Now we've got that on every step, which is nice. Or hi-hat. 
choose track seven here. Let's offset that as well. That's better. We don't need anything on track eight. This is already a very complete, very interesting beat that we've made very quickly using the Euclidean rhythm generation. This function sets how many hits you want within that pattern length. And this one offsets it, right? And we can change the lengths too. Very cool. So this, now we're getting into ways to create beats. Almost generatively, right? I mean, we're still controlling, but we aren't programming it beat per beat. We're using a mathematical algorithm or equation, right? Let's set those lengths back again. Reset it. Cool. So that's an Euclidean rhythm. And remember, you can uh, modulate these parameters, right? If we go to the modulation matrix, that's right here. So we have number of beats and rotation here. And we can randomize those and create interesting rhythms that way, for example. So for this kick drum, let's select this the Euclidean number generator for the kick drum and we'll select the first random voltage, right? And then we can do the same for this one, but we'll select the second random voltage, and then we can do the same for this one, and select these other random voltage. And then for the rotation, we can do it backwards. So we can use seven for the first one, six for the second, and five. Actually, this should be five, right? So it's always different. And now let's hear that. Oh, I forgot to set the modulation amounts, right? Let's go back here. Let's set the modulation amounts for these six points here. Now we're randomly generating Maybe less modulation for the number. There you go, so it's not so dense. So we have our kicks and snare being randomly generated, but based on Euclidean principles. Very, very cool love this function. Now this little icon here, this is called Sculpt, right? And what this one does is it creates an offset for the step probability. You can make it be less or more for the entire track, right? Including all the steps in the track. So for example, this crazy beat that we've just made here, it's very dense, right? What if we offset? Let's hit the uh, function and there we have whatever tracks are blinking will be affected by the scope parameter but that'll be dependent on our probability settings so why don't we set some probabilities here all right let's uh setting lower probabilities for a lot of these steps. All right. So now this is a super sparse, much sparser beat. Let's go back to the sculpt. And uh, yeah, we can select all tracks. 
right? As you select them, they start to blink. And now I can use my encoder to control the density. Right. So this is super sparse here. Even sparser. And here we go, super dense. 100% probability of everybody happening. can also be a really cool live performance feature. All right? It's a way to create variation very easily for your beat. But yeah, remember you have to set probabilities first. We're still randomizing the Euclidean parameters, which is also creating quite a bit of variation. Let's swing this beat a little bit. Bring down the tempo. Go back to Sculpt. Dance, sparse. This is a completely novel feature I've never seen in a sequencer before. Very cool. And to finish off with this row of functions, we have this little alien guy over here. What is the alien guy? That is the master filter. So basically, if I choose that, I can now filter the entire thing. And you can see it reflected on this last row here. So green, all green means the uh, cutoff frequency is all the way down. And as you bring it back up, it starts getting redder, right? So the red indicates the cutoff frequency. And holding shift will change the resonance. So this is another very handy live performance feature. All right? Hold shift again, reduce the resonance, and bring it back up. And you can modulate this externally as well. It's in the modulation matrix. When you just hold shift, press this guy, and select a random here. And set the modulation amount. There we go, so we're randomizing that filter now. Let's bring up the uh, resin so we can really hear it. Very cool. And as you can see, the colors change now because there's modulation happening. And if you want to reset the master filter parameters quickly without having to dial it back, you can just hold shift and function and press the filter. Now that's reset it, but it's still uh, receiving that modulation, right? So if we want to remove the modulation, we'll have to go back to that modulation and reduce the amount to zero. And there, there it goes. No more filter automation. And that concludes all of the functions in row four.